everyone to uh, this month's Best Practices Toolkit phone call. Uh, I'm Travis Atkinson with TBD Solutions. And um, yeah, I hope that uh, this is capping off a good week for everyone. Uh, we are going to uh, be talking today about uh, the intake process in crisis residential programs. And uh, we'll also be doing a spotlight on uh, some of the crisis services in uh, Colorado Springs, Colorado uh, through Aspen Point. Um, and then we will review some of the results of our survey and have some discussion around that. Um, if you are not joining through our Skype link, uh, then you can open the attachment that I sent out um, about 15 minutes ago uh, with the, the slides uh, for today's meeting. Now I did get a couple um, uh, bounce back emails because of the size of the slides. So I also wanted to show you where you can download those slides. Um, if you go to www.crisisresidentialnetwork.com and you click on the best practices workgroup icon um, and you scroll all the way to the bottom, um, I've uploaded the slides for today's meeting. Uh, so if you click on download file, um, you'll be able to pull up those slides uh, for yourself. So we, uh, just, just to let you know, TBD Solutions is uh, sponsoring this project uh, proudly, and uh, we uh, provide crisis program support um, to uh, crisis programs of all types of organizations. We also offer a middle management training, which uh, several of our um, our participants in our work group uh, have uh, attended um, and you can find out more about what we do here uh, at tbdsolutions.com. So an update on our work group, uh, we continue to add um, uh, pro uh, providers, participants to our work group as well as uh, new states. So we just hit our 30th, which we're excited about. Uh, so we have about 110 participants uh, from 30 states as well as from England and Costa Rica. Um, we estimate that there's about 300 crisis homes uh, or crisis programs that exist nationwide. And uh, for those of you that have been on our calls, uh, you know that we've had some pretty extensive discussions about you know, how we define those services and, and when we, we use so many different names like crisis residential or crisis stabilization or I heard a new one uh, this week, I think it was acute treatment unit. Um, but you know, we're, to, we're talking about this step down or this alternative um, from inpatient or, or ED or in some cases from jail. Um, and so right now we estimate that there's about 300 that are, that are involved and we continue to um, try to encourage providers that uh, we're just getting to know or just finding out about uh, to participate in our work group. Uh, we would like to welcome the new participants that we have uh, since the last time that we met up, which uh, those are from Utah and New York and North Carolina, Montana and Texas and Vermont. So we're very excited to have to having you join our work group. So we are going to start with a, uh, a, a spotlight on on Aspen Point in Colorado, and um, Barbara from Aspen Point is going to uh, take over for a little bit and tell us about uh, the services. Um, Barbara, are you there? Great, welcome. Um, I will uh, I will be your um, I don't know your co-pilot or just you know the person that's like uh, responding to your turn. So you just let me know and uh, I'll I'll hand it over to you. That's great. Thank you. Um, all right. So I appreciate having the opportunity to talk about what we are doing here in Colorado. I'm going to talk about two different things. Um, so in the state of Colorado, um, we have established Colorado Crisis Services, which is a statewide crisis response system. So part of what I'm going to talk about is that statewide system. And then part of what I'll talk about is Aspen Point specifically and how we are a part of this system and some of the things that we are doing here. Um, the state, and I'll talk about this a little bit more here in a second. Um, broken into four regions. So Aspen Point is responsible for one of the regions. So we'll talk about a few different things. Um, so 
Travis, if you'll move to the next slide. So, and like I said, we established Colorado Crisis Services. This was part of the vision of our governor um, to establish a no wrong door crisis system. Um, so through a Senate bill, we uh, system or statewide increased access to crisis services that are available 24 seven, open to anyone of all ages. So we serve children through seniors. Um, services are available regardless of the ability to pay. So what that means is that we still, for any of these services, we still take Medicaid information or commercial insurance information um, and bill those parties respectively. However, if a service is not covered through, typically through commercial insurance or um, the individual has no coverage at all, then through this statewide system or through these dollars, we're able to cover the cost of those services. The services are all provided regardless of residency, um, all presentation driven. So the way that we talk about uh, these services, it's really like accessing an emergency department um, for physical health. You don't have to have a PCP. You don't already have to have a diagnosis when something is going on to access care. Um, you're able to just walk in 24 hours a day and immediately um, access care. And that's basically the same way that these services have been set up, um, providing the right service at the right location at the right time. As part of this system uh, of care, there are a few different services available. Starting with the statewide hotline, that's kind of the front door. So we have a hotline that is manned 24-7. Um, we also have walk-in centers, we have mobile response, and then from so any of those services, we're able to refer for into crisis stabilization units or respite services. Um, really the key to this idea or to the Senate bill um, providing these services to keep people from having to sit in the emergency department um, or utilizing our emergency departments for some of these psychiatric emergencies, which was not the best level of care for the individual. And as we all know, that's not the best thing for the emergency department either um, because we have people in medical emergency who need to be in those beds. We also um, need to basically um, adjust or work alongside law enforcement and first responders because they see these people in crisis. Um, typically they're seeing all of them between law enforcement and our emergency departments, they're seeing everyone first. Um, and we had a, a breakdown in that once law enforcement or first responders, psychiatric de or uh, emergency departments saw these folks, they weren't getting routed back to the behavioral health specialist to prevent that cycle of crisis. So individuals were remaining kind of in that cycle and um, which as you know, as I'm sure you all are aware or, or experienced in your communities, um, has a drain on those resources and we never get these people the actual resources to um, get out of crisis and thrive. Um, so moving on to the next slide, the flow from an individual, and I realize that this is small, um, but when you all look at the actual slides, you'll be able to see this a little bit bigger. Um, basically, if I'm in crisis, I have a few options. I can call the state hotline, and the hotline, because it's manned by uh, clinical staff, they are able to do an evaluation, and then determine, are we able to do a an intervention over the phone? And I'm sorry, I can call or text to the hotline, but they're gonna determine, are we doing an intervention over the phone? or do you need eyes on a different type of intervention? So if they determine that I, I as a caller, I'm, in, uh, in a, I'm experiencing a crisis that actually needs to have some eyes on, I need to work with someone else, then they're going to evaluate, am I able to get myself safely to a walk-in center? Or um, is my level of crisis so acute that we need to dispatch mobile? Mobile means that a clinician will go out to the location of crisis. So that might be the um, hospital, that might be a jail, the 7-Eleven or someone's home, a school, anything like that. They're going out to the location of crisis. 
um, and then they're going to dispatch or connect the caller appropriately. Moving on to the next slide, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about what the hotline actually does. So the hotline, like I said, is kind of the front door, um, immediate access. People can call when they are on the verge of crisis. They're experiencing uh, very stressful situations and they just need to talk to someone before it actually escalates um, into a full-blown crisis. We can, um, individuals can call on the behalf of someone else. So if I'm concerned about my friend, my family member, my neighbor, I can call and say, this is what I'm experiencing with this person. These are the things that I'm seeing. And they can provide some of that insight of, you know, this sounds severe. Can we try to get this person on the phone? Um, here are some warning signs to look for. Here are some uh, additional resources that you can connect with in your community. Um, the hotline is also able to be a resource to other professionals, meaning teachers, uh, law enforcement, emergency medical, anyone in the community is able to call and say, this is what I'm seeing from a behavioral health standpoint. What are some options? What are, is this severe enough that I need to be um, moving on or getting them in front of a behavioral health professional? Or is this something that we can uh, do an intervention right now? And then they're able to, if needed, um, speak to the individual directly. They also are able to do where they conduct follow-up calls after someone has accessed their crisis line. As a part of the line, they have also established a support line which is staffed by a peer specialist. Peer specialist meaning someone with lived experience um, either themselves or with a close family member or loved one that has experienced uh, behavioral health or substance use challenges. Um, the support line can be uh, very beneficial for those people that need kind of continuous ongoing supports or check-ins. Um, they can also do some of the, the triage pieces, they do some of the follow-up calls, and um, they can handle those calls for someone that's really just looking for referrals and looking to link to resources in their community. So moving on to the next slide here. Um, because this is a statewide system, the state is broken up into four regions. So the 64 counties are broken up amongst these four um, entities that you see at the bottom. So Aspen Point is responsible for the southeastern 22 counties highlighted here in purple. Um, so for our area, this is a large geographic area. We have the second largest urban community in our region um, for the entire state. And we also have some of the most rural and frontier areas as well. So moving on to the next slide, we'll talk about how Aspen Point actually, uh, what services we offer up that you can actually um, expect in our 22 counties. So again, we um, have access or we're a part of this hotline. Um, the other benefit to the hotline is that if I am in Colorado and I live in one of these southern counties, but I travel up north to one of the northern counties, and I experience a crisis, I can call, regardless of where I'm located, they will do their triage, and based on where I'm physically located, they're going to get me connected with resources that are located where I am. So for the southern region right now, we currently have two walk-in centers, um, one in Colorado Springs and one in Pueblo. We are also opening um, additional walk-in centers, two associated with our hospital associate or our hospital campuses. Um, in those areas. So um, we will be growing to four 24 hour a day crisis walk-in centers. We do have some other walk-in centers that are available throughout the more rural communities. However, they're not accessible 24 seven. So for that reason, they're not located here, but in some of those um, more rural or frontier areas, they do have some access to walk-in services. It's just not accessible 24 seven, so it looks a little bit different. Um, mobile response is the piece that across the state, the expectation for mobile response is that a clinician will go out to the location of crisis. In Southern Colorado, that looks a little bit different. Um, oftentimes we may respond um, alongside or as a co in a co-response model with law enforcement, uh, meaning that law enforcement may respond first and we have a clinician up afterward. We have some models where a um, 
clinician will ride alongside with a law enforcement officer and they will arrive together. In some areas, that means that um, there are some ambulance districts or emergency medical services that are able to respond and do some of the triage and get people appropriately routed. Um, we also offer crisis residential respite and crisis stabilization units. So um, respite is the traditional um, definition of respite that uh, for those needing a um, safe place away from their current environment, we have access to get people referred into respite. And then for crisis stabilization units, this is similar, to, this is a step down from inpatient care um, similar to an acute treatment unit where um, these units are both 16 bed units um, and carry 20, uh, 2765 designations um, or um, hold the designation. Bar Barbara, could you tell us a little bit more about the specs around the crisis residential respite? Um, are those, I noticed two of the, two of the homes look like uh, children's homes are, are is it two and two and then like what what are the like you know length of stay and size and some of those features sure um so all of these are a little bit different there are two that um focus more on kids one that focuses specifically on um typically youth or younger adults with um idd and then the others are uh, range from uh, really focusing on some substance use recovery alongside of mental health um, or co-occurring as well as just mental health um, or behavioral health type um, respite facilities. The length of stay is a max of 14 days. So the length can actually vary. Um, it can be anywhere from three to five days with a max up to 14. Typically in our region, we don't, it's very rare that we see stays over seven days. Um, and typically those are um, more acute cases where we're looking for a more long-term option. Typically the average is about seven days. Great, thank you. Um, so moving on to the next slide. Um, for walk-in centers, um, like we, I talked about a little bit earlier, no appointment is necessary. Um, anyone is able to walk in at any time, regardless of the ability to pay. Um, services are available regardless of residency, which is um, definitely a situation that our communities face and um, prohibits a lot of people from accessing care. Um, our, all of the walk-in centers are staffed with licensed professionals, uh, master's level professionals, some have VA level, as well as peer specialists. So when someone walks in, they have different levels of folks that they're able to work with, but we do have licensed uh, staff available to be able to do that full crisis evaluation and initiate holds if necessary. We also coordinate with our community detox, uh, inpatient facilities, our emergency departments, um, specifically for detox, if someone comes to us and they have um, some substances on board, but they're still able to benefit from intervention, we will still work with them. If they um, are too heavily intoxicated, we will get them transported over to our county detox. Uh, detox will, when they release those individuals, they will coordinate the discharge with our walk-in center so that we can have um, someone from our behavioral health healthcare team um, meet with that individual before they discharge because we know that there was a component or a concern um, before they went to detox. So we wanna make sure that we don't just send them back out into the community without any resources or without actually meeting that need for them. So we've been able to work very closely alongside of our detox um, to meet that need as well. Um, we, if we, have a client or an individual that needs an inpatient level of stay or level of care where that's not um, anything that our centers provide. We work with our community inpatient hospitals so um, to strengthen that community continuum of care as well as with our emergency departments um, for those medical services. That might mean that our emergency departments are transferring folks that end up in the ER still that start off there because they Typically, we're not aware of, of the walk-in centers being available 
um, so they will get them transported over to us and vice versa, that if we have someone show up at our walk-in center that definitely has a primary medical concern, we will get them transported over to the emergency department to handle that, and then they will work with us to get that person routed back over to us, um, to our walk-in center, so that we can fully meet the need of that client. Moving on to the next slide. So for our mobile teams, um, what I describe for mobile is true of the entire state. However, in Colorado Springs, we've done something a little bit different um, than what, we, what you would see across the rest of the state. Our Community Response Team, or CRT, is a collaboration with our fire department, police department, and Aspen Plain as a behavioral health provider. So we have two units which consist of three people each. Each unit has a one officer, one medical professional, so we have currently one nurse and one EMT from the fire department, and a licensed clinician. Um, these units respond within our city because of the police department jurisdiction, and they run seven days a week from 10 to 7. These teams are dispatched either through 911, if someone calls 911 and they have a welfare check or um, there's any type of concern that could be behavioral health related, this, these teams will be dispatched out. If someone calls the Colorado Crisis Hotline and they determine that mobile is needed within Colorado Springs, they will dispatch this unit. If someone comes to uh, one of our um, an outpatient site and they may be struggling or a local doctor's office um, and they are in acute crisis, they may also call to access this unit as well as if an officer uh, or team of officers respond to a call that actually turns out to be more behavioral health related, they will do a unit to unit and call out this team. So the team is able to respond, the officer goes in and assesses the scene for safety, um, no uh, weapons, uh, that the client or the individual is not overly aggressive and they're able to respond to intervention. And then the medical professional will go in and assess for primary uh, presentation of any medical concerns. So typically they're looking for has the individual ingested anything or caused any self-harm? Is there anything like that going on? Um, and then the licensed clinician will go in and do the evaluation. So the, the piece that makes this different from most co-responder models is the medical component. In working with our community uh, emergency department and uh, medical directors, as well as our in, uh, area inpatient facilities, if CRT, they're all in agreement that if CRT responds to a call and they are able to medically clear the individual in the field using ISAT equipment, the um, inpatient facilities will accept a direct transfer from this unit. They are able to directly transport instead of going to the um, emergency department as their current or as their previous uh, medical protocols dictated. They're able to actually transport the individual directly to an area um, psychiatric hospital for admittance. So that does a couple of things. That shortens their time, where typically someone would have to go to the emergency department to receive medical clearance, which could take easily four to six hours, and then someone would have to, the hospital would have to get them transported over to the hospital. The individuals now in crisis, they're able to go directly from sometimes their home to the hospital bed within about an hour and a half. So this co-response model, um, while it's not 24 seven and outside of those areas or outside of those times, we have a clinician respond to those locations. Um, and we've also done a lot of training to ensure that the Colorado Springs Police Department, um, each of their classes of officers are trained through CIT. Uh, their full department has a little more knowledge. They're able to transport folks directly to the walk-in center if there's a crisis in the individuals not too uh, severely aggressive or anything like that. They don't have any medical um, concerns. Um, so it's changed the way that our entire community responds to crisis. Um, having that buy-in from the police department and the fire department, 
definitely changes the way both of those entities respond to these types of crises. And our emergency departments are reporting that they see more um, accurate types of response or types of crises. Uh, when they're seeing someone in behavioral health crisis, typically they're seeing the co-occurring with substance use or there is uh, a medical component as well that needs to be addressed. Uh, so they're definitely seeing a shift in clients utilizing the, the walk-in centers as well as uh, mobile response, getting these folks routed to the walk-in centers or appropriate hospital. Um, and when these folks are identified by the CRT, unit um, and they're able to respond and intervene that's also reduced the number of people going into the uh, criminal justice system as well um, moving on to the next slide um, that's really a quick overview of some of the things that are happening across the colorado system and then as well as um, more locally in the south southeastern part of colorado um, do you have any questions, or Travis, how do you want to handle questions? Um, I think what works best on a conference call is when we just hear like radio silence and then everyone talks at the same time. That's been kind of my experience. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. I, I will start it with questions, but then we can kind of do that awkward silence thing for a minute and see if other people have them, or, or we can uh, see if people want to type them through Skype for those who are using that. Um, my question is, so I was really impressed when I first started learning about uh, Colorado Crisis Services and the, like the, the coordination of care or, or really the communication, I should say, between providers in the state, like crisis providers talking to one another or having a forum that it sounds like is supported by the state. Could you talk a little bit about what that looks like as far as, you know, whether, whether it's a monthly meeting, it's, it's emails, like how you share um, about the good that you're doing or about the you know the common struggles that you're having and and you know what what that network or what that community is like absolutely um, so there's actually a couple of forums so first because we're broken into four regions there is a lead like myself in each of the regions so um, depending on what we're working on at the time we either meet every two weeks or at least monthly um, and we go over a plethora of things. So because it's a statewide system, there are some regional components that we have to work through, but we're able to use that team as kind of a best practice, uh, bounce some ideas off of people and really learn from other areas. Um, we are also able to um, work through different things as far as data collection, how we collect data, um, how we approach crisis phone calls if they come directly to the center, how we work through some different challenges with uh, community entities. Um, in some areas, a ho uh, medical hospital systems are completely on board, where um, in some areas it's more of a challenge. Um, so that, um, that forum, um, after we all meet, we always meet with the state. Um, on a monthly basis as well, so that we can take anything that we've been able to identify as um, improvements that we are making or uh, regional shifts that we're able to make, um, as far as, or, and as well as um, any uh, structural changes. So when we're changing, uh, we identify that the data that we're, at one point we identified that the some of the data pieces that we were collecting were not as impactful. We were missing some areas of opportunity. So um, coming together and identifying what are those pieces that across the state people want to see so that we have a state picture um, and data source that we can provide. Um, in Colorado Springs specifically uh, or around the community response team, we have um, an oversight community that does basically the same thing. However, that one is comprised of both of our area hospitals, medical hospital system, um, both of our psychiatric hospitals, detox, fire department, police department, um, the SROs for our school. Um, most of our schools have resource officers, so we have a connection with them as well, uh, as well as, as Aspen Point. So we are able to talk about in the community we're seeing an increase of meth use and how that's being approached or how it's being talked about. Or in our schools we're seeing an increase of this and how we're approaching it and how we're talking about it. So uh, there are really two different areas where communities are coming together to talk about what's happening in the community and how we approach, and then at a statewide level as well. 
Awesome. All right, yeah, we'll open up for uh, other questions. This is Patricia Darlin from <clears throat> Wichita, Kansas. I'm the Director of Crisis and Outpatient Services here for Home Care. I had two questions. Um, first, I want to compliment you. This is an impressive program. Um, you mentioned that you have texting capabilities. Do you use a specific software for that? And if you do, do you have policies related to that? And the second one is, do you use any televideo? <clears throat> yes. So um, currently in the crisis system, we're not specifically using televideo. There are some centers that are able to use it, um, like in our jail system. Um, the center can specifically do televideo with some individuals, so it's not widespread across the state. Um, to your question about texting, because it's run through Rocky Mountain Crisis Partners, they do have a specific software and protocols around um, who responds, so they still have clinical staff responding to those, um, how they respond, what are the things that they cover, as well as if someone hasn't responded in the last two minutes, um, or if it's taken more than two minutes, that you're checking in a couple of times, and that if they still don't respond, making a phone call to them, uh, you know, depending on the severity of crisis. If initially in the um, texting communication, it appears that it is more acute than what they're going to be able to handle through text, um, then they ask for, you know, the ability to connect via phone and they try to escalate it and move um, into a different modality of communication. But I can um, get some of that information about the type of software that they use um, and I can share that with Travis to share with you all. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Yep. Hi, this is Sheree Lowe with the California Hospital Association. Uh, and I, I echo um, my compliment for a good presentation. I'm really curious if the model that Colorado used was based on their trauma system that is already in place, or do they have a disaster? regional program that is in place that this was modeled after or is this complete and separate from either of those systems? Um, this is completely uh, completely separate from either of those systems. There was never a discussion about making it all one system. There was a um, discuss there were discussions early early on um, about that become about it being one system um, and how those things align and, and come together, that's not how it ultimately came to be. Um, yeah, I'll leave at that. Well, but, but why didn't it come to be? I mean, what were the obstacles that forced, again, a bifurcation of the mental health delivery system from the physical health delivery system? Um, there were a lot of reasons, um, and I don't really have a, a quick answer for you. Um, I would be happy to share my contact information, and we can talk about that offline if you want to. Um, I was not a part of those conversations, so I can't speak to all of the details, um, but it's not really a quick answer. There's, uh, there's quite a bit involved in that decision. Um, yeah. I would appreciate having that conversation offline. Thank you. Sure. And what I'll do for everyone that's interested in connecting with you, Barbara, is when I send out um, like the minutes or the follow-up, um, I'll also include your contact information if, if you think that makes sense. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Barbara? Okay, cool. Thank you, um, Barbara. Very good stuff. Um, we appreciate you. Uh, um, taking some time to, to talk us through the, the system. It sounds robust. Um, it sounds uh, collaborative and um, something that I think most of our communities uh, stand to, to benefit learning from. So thank you again. Absolutely. Thanks. Okay, so we're going to jump into our uh, topic for this month, and it is um, intake. So for those of you who are, who maybe this is your first call, you've only been in a couple, uh, this is just a quick review of what we've covered so far. So we've, for, since December when we had our first, so our first uh, our first actual phone call I believe was in, uh, was actually the December call. So we've talked about staffing, we've talked about scope and function, 
um, of, of crisis services. We've talked about uh, metrics and outcomes. Uh, in March, we talked about taxonomy and community relations. Um, in uh, this past month, we talked about treatment philosophy and approach. And this month, we are going to be talking about intake. And I, saw, I found this picture, and I thought that maybe, um, you know, if every crisis program had a phone like this, um, it would probably embody <clears throat> part of how uh, people feel in a given day in their crisis program. Um, but, you know, I also want to recognize before we start jumping into some of the data that was uh, collected in our surveys, um, that if you were to assess, <clears throat> excuse me, where the stress points are in uh, providing crisis services, uh, or, or maybe it's a pinch point, um, I think that intake is, is often a place where it can start, where um, staff can, can be worn down by uh, power struggles with um, um, with referral sources or um, suspicion about what the what the level of service is about and if they even feel confident uh, referring there and um, it, it can just it, it's something that I don't think we, we should take lightly in it and um, it w I was really pleased to see how much um, intention and purpose um, our providers that are participating in this work group uh, take in their intake process uh, because it's not just filling out a piece of paper, it's not just doing a you know a, a basic screening, um, but there's a lot that goes into it, and you know there's a there's a gatekeeping component, or there's a, a you know a risk management component, and and uh, and, and so it can, that can be pretty exhausting, and um, especially if you have um, staff who are uh, asked to do a lot of different things in the home almost simultaneously, um, and do an intake on top of that. I mean, try to make sure that they're preserving the integrity and the safety of your program. Um, I can certainly remember some of my experiences uh, taking admissions or being consulted on admissions in uh, the crisis programs and kind of just being surprised by some of the behaviors of the referring clinicians. Uh, sometimes they'll, sit, they'll literally say whatever they need to say in order to get someone in. Um, I remember one time I was talking to a clinician uh, that was trying to make a referral, and I asked um, what the person's diagnosis was, and he and I literally heard him make up a diagnosis on the phone. He said, "Well, let's give him a depressive disorder NOS," and I just wondered if he was making that up because he really wanted to get the referral done, or if that was it. it didn't sound like really great savvy clinical judgment to me. So, um, you know, there are there are mini battles or micro battles that, that staff and clinicians and, and, and treatment teams have to face every day um, in the programs. And I think sometimes it can even just start at, at the phone or at the front door with, um, with trying to complete the intake process. So we asked about seven or eight questions um, this month and, and the first one was just kind of a, uh, a, a process question about which employees at your crisis program take on uh, intake responsibilities, and it was actually pretty evenly distri distributed. Um, for and one of the few times in our surveys that we've asked, um, the other option was was responded to the most. Uh, that there can be some some um, some programs reported that everyone's involved in the process. You know, so you think about doing a nurse to nurse, doing a um, you know a doc to doc. Uh, you know, having the, the intake worker that, that almost like everyone isn't just, can, you know, everyone isn't just informed, but everyone is consulted or everyone is responsible for a part of the intake process. Um, but about 40% uh, of the respondents uh, said that, that uh, a master's level social worker is taking on the primary responsibilities. And then about 35 to 40% uh, said that direct care providers take on those responsibilities. And you can see some of the other people who are listed. Um, and I imagine that, you know, the smaller the home, <clears throat> uh, the smaller the home, the more diverse you have to be in your skill set. And so your direct care staff may very well, on a, on a second shift when the, when the, uh, the social worker isn't there, you're going to pass medications, you're going to make dinner, you're going to run a group, and you're going to do an intake maybe, and that, and that could all happen in the same... Uh, in the same shift, if especially if you know someone calls in sick or you're you're providing some training or whatever it is, um, so 
looking at the next slide, <clears throat> this was kind of on the other side about where referrals come from, like what the most common areas are that they that um, that referrals could uh, that the people could be referring from. And far and away, it was psychiatric hospital staff and case managers. That was almost 90% of, of where referrals come from. And then after that, the emergency department staff, the outpatient therapists, and the psychiatrists. And I think that speaks a lot about the importance of, of good relationships with those, uh, with those providers, with those community partners. Uh, I know that there is a, uh, there's one of the crisis homes in Michigan uh, is very intentional about their outreach. That even if they've, even if they have a strong relationship with the local emergency de departments, it doesn't mean that they stop going to visit the staff meetings, you know, to bring cookies, to bring some flyers, to just you know talk about the program and keep people aware of what's going on. Um, you know, so so often if if you think of a program that you interact with um, minimally then you're only going to remember some really basic pieces of information about that. And so it's, it's always good to hammer that home and to, um, and, and to just, you know, reinforce that to get, whether you've got like staff at the corporate level that are dedicated to public relations, if they're going to go out and speak on your program, certainly make sure that they, um, that they understand your program pretty intimately. Um, but if you've, if you've got the staff, like dedicate a, a half day every month, um, to getting out and, and, and talking to people at the hospitals and um, I think the other benefit of that is that you get people talking in a non-crisis uh, under non-crisis terms instead of trying to build relationship when there's like stress or there's a transaction happening um, but actually just being able to engage in a dialogue when um, when everyone's guard is down a little bit more can kind of go a long way um, as far as d documentation like how uh, um, how a referral is, is transcribed. It was pretty even. Um, the, 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 there's about 40% of providers that are using their electronic health record to do the intake process. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but then uh, a, a third, you know, is, sure is doing it on paper, and then uh, a fair amount are doing both. You know, they're, they're having things like the disclosure and the consent and the bag check are done on paper, and then the rest is done electronically. Um, maybe those those documents are scanned in um, uh, some and, and only for some programs only in the last five years or so have they been able to have the technology such as a, a computer on wheels um, and, or a tablet or, or other pieces that they can use to um, uh, you know to to uh, get done what they need to um, and be able to you know like if you want to sit in a, a client's room to do an intake because that would make them feel more comfortable or they're exhausted, well then you have to have the technology that's going to be able to follow them uh, to do that. Um, <clears throat> this was a question about efficiency, about you know, do you track the length of time from referral to completion of intake? And 70% of the participants do. Um, one of them mentioned that they track length of time from referral to screening, uh, the time to complete the screening, and the length of time to complete admission. And then um, so somebody else responded that referral to admission takes about two hours, but it has to be completed within 24 hours of admission, especially if com someone comes in in the, in the middle of the night. Um, so if you have a window of up to 24 hours, that can be kind of hard to know whether or not, you know, uh, depending on how seriously people are taking it or, or, or how much they recognize that that's a metric that's important to them. Um, I apologize for the spelling error. Um, I will get right on the guy that put these slides together. Uh, what is the average time from initial phone call to program admission? Um, about 25, 27% said one to two hours, and then 27% said three or more hours. Um, and then some of the comments that came in were that full beds and high numbers of referrals make this difficult to decipher information from. Um, and I think that that's a good point that um, you might have someone that's referred, or you might go through like a couple really basic steps, but not be ready to, to complete that until you have a discharge. And then, so then do you count that from when they first called, or do you count that from, you know, when you actually started the, the screening process? Um, and then some people have contracts with like the, the county that they abide in, but then other neighboring counties, and so that might 
uh, be different. They might have different parameters. And a good parallel to that would be like a mobile crisis team that's covering two counties and they're based out of one county. They might make one commitment to their home county compared to the, the other contracted county that's, that's nearby. Uh, this next question was, how do you explain the house rules and expectations for treatment? Um, about 80 to 85% said that the, um, well, 80, I should say 85% said the pertinent house rules are reviewed during intake, and then 80% said program expectations are uh, reviewed during intake. Um, a few other people said that there's a handbook that's given out every time a person uh, comes into the program. And then uh, another program said that selected house rules are reviewed in the morning group. Um, where I imagine that's probably daily, where, you, where they're, they're picking a, a house rule and just reminding people of it or going over it. OK, so this uh, slide asks if people do maintain a waiting list. And uh, less than half of the programs maintain a waiting list. And so um, I wanted to ask a question and pose this to the group right now. Uh, because I've heard recently about some states that have statewide electronic bed boards for psychiatric hospitals. Um, so I just wanted to ask about the presence of um, electronic bed boards either in your state for psychiatric hospital beds or for crisis stabilization or crisis residential beds. And um, if those do exist or if, you're, if your organization does use those, could you tell us a little bit about how those function as well as um, uh, who has access to them? I can speak up. I'm calling from Columbus, Ohio. This is Carrie Weirich. Hi, Carrie. Are you there? Yes. Hey. Um, yeah, we have, it's not statewide. Um, we have in uh, central Ohio, we have a, a bed board where we have, um, when it's functioning well, we have. Um, private hospitals, freestanding psychiatric hospitals, the state hospital, um, all for adults, and our um, centralized uh, crisis, um, it's, we, it's a crisis psychiatric emergency room. Um, and when it's functioning well, we have a daily call seven days a week um, and an electronic bed board so that no matter where the individual is, what ER they're in, um, if there's no beds in their, um, in the unit, in the hospital where they are, um, then they may go to another hospital or at net care since we are um, uh, like a psychiatric emergency room, we don't have a lot and so we transfer folks through there. One challenge that we've really had though is with the Medicaid expansion, um, uh, there's been more individuals with uh, Medicaid um, and uh, not more hospital beds. So there's going to be a change in the rules July 1, so we're hoping that July 1, freestanding psychiatric hospitals will um, take individuals with Medicaid. But right now, technically, the only hospitals that can take them are general hospitals instead of freestanding private psych hospitals. Really? Okay. So it, yeah, it, it worked fantastic when we didn't, when we had enough kind of beds in the system or, or not enough, but uh, it was more workable. But since the Medicaid expansion, which is wonderful from the patient's perspective, but because the capacity wasn't uh, built in, um, it kind of locked up. We got um, so many um, individuals with Medicaid going to ERs and going to our crisis center that the hospital couldn't work collaboratively because there just weren't enough beds to go around. So everybody just started looking after their own, uh, the people in their own hospitals instead of taking someone else's. Okay. So we're hoping that that will resolve, but it's been, it's been super. Um, when the bed issue um, is up, was really, and I know the state system was looking at doing something like that, um, but we had, do have the state hospital participating in our bed board. Okay, great. Thank you, Carrie. It's really nice <laughs> to see who has beds and who doesn't. Yeah, yeah. That's nice transparency. Thank you. This is Patricia Darling from Wichita, Kansas again. Kansas does have a bed board that's facilitated by Kansas Health Solutions. 
and it is updated uh, by each uh, psychiatric hospital, um, uh, and they are, they're designated by whether they're children, how many children's beds, how many adult beds, how many Jerry psych, um, our crisis observation and stabilization stabilization unit are on there as well as our detox unit and um, they provide the, the location, the phone number, who to call, when it was last updated, how many beds they have available and it's been really especially helpful in Kansas since the Osawatomie State Hospital moratorium has been in effect um, so we're able to you know, access that those numbers pretty quickly if we need to look at placement outside of our area. Okay, great. Thank you, Tisha. This is Jessica from uh, Clarinda, Iowa, with Turning Point uh, Residential Services. Um, I know that in Iowa here, they've been working on um, developing this model um, for the last, I would say, about two years now since. They closed several of our mental health institutions, and um, it's not going very successful, and that's kind of the biggest frustration. I know um, our Department of Human Services is now presenting that um, each of our inpatient psychiatric hospitals have to complete it, and they will be presenting that, I think, in front of our legislatures here soon, or it's, it's already has been need to start implementing the, the use of this tool um, because I think our transportation is typically about three hours away. So it's been kind of frustrating in our area. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Anyone else? Well, this is Cherie from California again. Um, uh, we have a bill currently before the legislature to mandate a real-time bed registry um, and so I've been doing a fair amount of research into the registries in other states, and uh, I, I've not found a model in any state that is in real time that, is, that works. So uh, I, I'm real curious if anybody uh, has, knows of a model that's in real time that actually works. I I have, this is Carrie from Columbus, Ohio. I have to say that our model has worked when we've had capacity, when we've had beds, and it's managed through the Ohio Hospital Association, um, and uh, if you want. And is it in real time? Yeah, yeah it's real time. Yeah, people enter, um, they enter a first name um, of an individual to uh, um, an internet website and uh, the time that they are, you know, uh, there's a clock that starts with how long it takes to get them in the hospital. Um, and there's all sorts of wonderful stats that uh, are generated and shared on a monthly basis where all of the area hospitals and net care get together and discuss what's going on. It, it's fallen apart because we don't have enough hospital beds, but it'll be interesting to see if we can get it going again when when in July when we will because we've got new hospitals that have been built. But um So that sounds yeah. like a reverse bed registry. That sounds like a patient registry. Where the patient's name is posted, here's their here's here's the description of the patient. They need a bed who want what who wants this patient. Is, is yeah. that how it works? Yeah, that's that that's that is how it works and, and right. each patient backed by first name in and um and what's really great is we have when we have new hospitals opening up who are anxious to fill their beds, they'll uh, they'll have people watching the bed board 24/7, and it'll be a race to see who who, who calls us first to get uh, get the person. Um, and we're hoping it will be like that in July again. But uh, yeah, I agree with you. The research that I've done and the experience I've had with true bed registry, they work extremely well when there's a surplus of beds and they become dysfunctional when there's not a surplus and having a bed registry a pure bed registry doesn't work anywhere but the reverse bed registry where the patient is registered tends to be the most working the best the challenge is um, patient choice um, because 
if it is if it goes to like the first opening is at hospital A, but the patient prefers hospital D, um, and uh, for all sorts of reasons, timeliness, yeah. safety, we send the person to hospital A, then um, that doesn't work. Yeah. So uh, because the patient's unhappy because they wanted to go to hospital D, so that's that's one of the considerations that is a flaw with the hospital registry or bed board system is um, is uh, choice. Unless there's a whole glut of beds, patient choice doesn't really figure in. Yeah. I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Thank you so much for, for everyone's feedback on this, and this may be a topic that we explore again in the future. Um, I want to move on just through our last few slides. Um, this is about how your crisis program works with referral sources to ensure that a strong coordination of care <clears throat> takes place. Um, and there were um, a couple of, uh, of cool responses. One of them was a, 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 a meeting that happens every time 72 hours after a person comes into care. And this was, I think, from RHD in Pennsylvania. Um, uh, he wasn't able to uh, they weren't able to join the call today, but um, but kind of gave a good description of like what that looks like and how they've noticed that their average length of stay is about six days, and so they put that 72-hour meeting kind of right smack dab in the middle of that, and it's kind of the expectation that family members and other people who are involved in the person's life um, are there at that in-person meeting uh, to 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 say, hey, you know, uh, we've we've talked about uh, we, you've come in, you've had some time in the program, you know, some time to stabilize. Discharge is happening pretty soon. Let's let's start to put that plan together. So, um, here's a few other uh, charts about um, the things that are provided to new clients at time of admission, and then uh, if discharge planning is initiated during uh, the intake process, which almost 90% of our participants said that yes, it is, it is, it is initiated. Um, I, we don't really have time to, to kind of throw this up for discussion, which I wanted to do, but um, if you have ideas on future topics, these are some of the things that we voted on uh, or that people have responded to. Uh, we send the initial survey that we did way back in October. We send that to every new person that comes into the group. Um, so if you have ideas for, um, for future topics or you think that one of the ones that we have listed would be um, you know, a really good direction to go, Please let me know, um, and we can we can do that. We'll probably make that decision here in the next week. Um, also, we are about six months into this right now. Um, if you have feedback on the work group and what might be um, uh, you know more helpful or more effective, um, please let me know. And then lastly, uh, I wanted to put a, a request out and see if um, anybody uh, would be able to help with some simple artwork or graphic design for our website. Uh, we just want to update the banner uh, to something that has kind of a kind of a, a good design that would uh, align well with um, our program. That would just have um, our, our our work group name kind of on the top of it, or um, or. Uh, our best practices toolkit on the top of it. So my email is there. Um, feel free to email me uh, with any, any answers to any of those three things. Also, a reminder, I brought this up in the last uh, in last month's uh, phone call, but there is a, a SAMHSA webinar series um, on trauma-informed innovations and crisis services. Uh, the next one is Monday, May 22nd. Um, unfortunately, there's not a place where you can register and kind of sign up for all of them. You have to do it individually, but that link that I have right there will get you where you need to go um, for that. Uh, we are going to start rotating the conference calls between Wednesdays and Fridays. Uh, so the next one is going to be Wednesday, June 21st. The one after that will be Friday, July 21st. Anybody that received my email with um, uh, either the meeting minutes or the reminder about the phone call, uh, will be included. If you want other people to be included in the work group, just send me their email addresses if they're within your within their team. Um, and the slides and recordings from today's uh, uh, session and, and almost all of the other ones we've done are available um, through our website, crisisresidentialnetwork.com. If you want to uh, email a question to the group, you can do that at crisisresidentialnetwork at tbdsolutions.com. That finishes up our call for today. Thanks so much to everyone who participated. Thank you to Barbara for talking about Colorado's crisis services, and we'll look forward to talking again next month.